I thought I would love to know, obviously some people know who you are, some people are unfamiliar. So if you could just give us a little bit of an understanding of, you know, your journey into how you came to the work you're doing and also what I'm wanting to focus on this is, is you as a, as a wise woman. As a wise woman. Yeah. Uh-huh. And wow. want to really, because uh-huh. I just know for me personally, like I know um, I'm moving in one direction in life and I always look for inspiration like my mum, huge. And then, yeah. So for I, look, I always look for wisdom and my guru, he's like, he's 70 odd, 10 kids. And I just think still going, he's such a force. And I look at you and I think, wow, you are such a force. And I remember when someone asked Gandhi, um, give me, a, what is your message? And then he said to that person, he wrote it on a note and passed it out the train window as it was taking off. And the person looked at it and he said, my life is my message. So when I look at yours, I think, well, your life is your message. And I wonder, what are the principles that you live by? What are the things that are the foundation of what determines how you operate in this world? my answer (coughs) is going to be quite different from what you'd expect. So my, any wisdom I have really comes from experiences I've had, and they were particularly amazing and sort of vast when I had the privilege of learning to speak an ancient Tibetan dialect and live in an ancient Tibetan culture for many years. And it was a culture that hadn't been affected by either colonialism or modernity development. So that's where almost anything I have to say comes from. And I will sound usually extremely arrogant because I have an opinion on everything based (laughs) on that experience, everything. And it's like sort of my Bible, you know, whenever I think, well, you know, what is it like with breath work or almost anything or how did they do it? And it's my Bible because they were the happiest, healthiest people I had ever encountered and I'm saying that after having lived with them well I first wrote a book called Ancient Futures after I had lived with them for 16 years at that point it was roughly half of every year it wasn't possible to stay this is a part of Tibet that's called Ladakh and it's the westernmost part of Tibet it's up on the plateau at 12,000 feet and the Dalai Lama is and was the spiritual head but it was also an independent kingdom, and it was invaded by India in the 1840s. And so it belonged to India. So when the Chinese went into central Tibet, the Indians went up there to guard all the borders. They wanted it to be known as Indian territory. But they hadn't let anyone go there. And then because there had been some spying going on, and the Chinese had managed to actually build a road, I think, between Chinese territory across Indian Tibet to Pakistan. They let in some tourists, but only to go in and out. So I was also, this is another story, which is sort of, I'm supposed to write in my memoir about being accused of being a spy and having been, having to flee and all kinds of things like that. But the really important part of it is that it is pretty unusual today to meet people who've had the experience of living in a culture that wasn't affected by colonialism or even by Christianity. So I'm so amazed, you know, when I hear about the most remote parts of like Papua and in Africa, and they're called Joseph and Mary. And I know that, I know what the impact of that is, and it is to create a sense of inferiority. So there's been this psychological pollution from a dominant Western system, and that system originally was, you know, was Christianity. Later on, it was force, slavery, and enclosures in Europe that drove Europeans also away from a land-based existence. So anyway, I've got a lot to say about all of that. And it probably also um, it figures into my being that I grew up primarily in Sweden, but I had family in, in Germany and England. I learned to speak a lot of languages. I, I studied in France and Spain and Italy, and I learned to speak a lot of languages, but they were all European. It was only when I came to Ladakh uh, as a 30-year-old woman in 1975 that I 
learn to pick up this language and and quickly and fluently. And so I, I spoke the language fluently while people still thought that they were perfectly fine the way they were. No one ever said, we're stupid and backward and please, please, can you sponsor a school so we can send our children to school so they can get a job in the city and live like Westerners. So that's the kind of thing that's still going on around the world that's actually a bit of a disaster. So please think before you sponsor schools. Hope you read my book, Ancient Futures. Education, on the other hand, I believe is the most important thing that we all need to engage in. And, and that's where I'm, I'm sort of practicing what I'm preaching in that my life has taken on the form of doing everything I could to share this message, to share the experience I had. I think most of us now realize that there's a lot to learn from indigenous cultures, particularly indigenous cultures where you know women had high status, where the feminine had high status, where also Buddhism, as it came into Tibet, incorporated animism. So it incorporated a profound respect for nature. So there's a lot to learn there. And, and for me, that translated into a bigger political and economic issue around the global economy versus local economies. It translated into an awareness that the fundamental things that we do as human beings, that we have valued through our whole evolution, are how we grow our children and how we grow our food. All of us in intergenerational communities were involved with both of those. And in the modern economy, people have been driven away from both. You know, some women left behind in nuclear families, which are really incapable of working well. I don't want to, you know, I'm sure most of you agree, but I, you know, I have a lot to share about the importance of doing everything we can to help our children have more significant others in their lives. And actually a Swedish <clears throat> sociologist friend of mine, many years ago, she did a study to see if higher education had an effect on self-esteem. And she knew the answer wasn't going to be yes. You know, the more you study, the more, you know, uh, the greater self-esteem. But the answer that emerged was that those who had the greatest self-esteem, and when we're talking about genuine self-esteem, we're not talking about egoic presentation of I am great. That's always an indicator of feeling exactly the opposite. When people feel secure in themselves, they have no need to put others down. They're interested in others. They're not afraid of diversity, of other opinions. So people who had that genuine self-esteem, it turned out, were the ones who had had the largest numbers of significant others as they were growing up. And they could have been a neighbor. They could have been a grandmother. And I do want to drop a name right now, Gabor Mate. I'm very happy that... He and I had a long conversation recently, and he so totally agrees with this fundamental importance of more significant others. And ideally, as in order for them to be significant, meaning positive, secure, long-lasting, they need to be intergenerational. So when we segregate children into separate age groups, it's a monoculture, and it breeds serious crises and problems, just as it does in nature. But I should probably shut up and let you say something. No. I was going to give you full permission <laughs> to just keep going. And, but also, don't think you're arrogant because you're not. You're erudite yeah. and you've yeah. lived, and those people that think you're arrogant are just ignorant. So please, we invite you here to really hear your story, your opinion, because you know, you're so valuable. So oh, please don't hold back. Give it thank to you. us. <laughs> Two pieces and a soda. Well, I guess I would say there's just so much. Like I said, I have something to say about everything because of that experience. And I feel like almost always it's just slightly different, even including, you know, what is my life's work? You know, there's been this very weird thing of sacrificing community, significant others, and connection to nature in order to try to share that message across the world. So I ended up 
for various reasons, well, uh, yeah, ancient futures got translated. The book and the film we made got translated into over 40 languages. And so there was interest from all over the world. And I found it very difficult to say no when people would say, we want to learn from this experience. We want to learn. So I was traveling all over and I... I almost didn't go to Ladakh. I was living in Paris when I was invited to go out as part of a film team, but I had traveled quite a lot before that. And since my family was in different countries and so on, I really wanted to be settled. But luckily I went to Ladakh. And then because of Ladakh, I ended up doing so much traveling. So I wasn't modeling what I am, as it were, teaching. I was trying to get this message out because I had become quite scared, I would say, of the impact of a global economy which was everywhere imposing a consumer monoculture. So what the Christians did was to also impose a monoculture, but they didn't reach the whole world. And the colonial powers, well, let's say slavery, they didn't enslave the entire globe. And even in the colonial era, every single person on the planet wasn't being affected by this. But here we were already by the, by the mid-70s, late 70s. Virtually every child was being colonized by a false idea of identity, of, of power, of intelligence, of beauty, colonized in a really disastrous way. And so I saw this as it came into Ladakh, and later on I worked in Bhutan, which many of you will have heard of, a little kingdom in the Himalayas, in a similar situation to Ladakh. And I saw there how even aged four or five, children were affected by these visuals. And they were literally, at that time, literally Barbie dolls for girls and Rambos with machine guns for boys. And at that time, they were white, everything white, you know, Barbie, blonde, blue-eyed. And now it's even more insidious. Now you can have dark skin, and you can have dark hair, and even brown eyes. It's even considered quite sexy now. But the basic stereotype is still an urban consumer role model. And the, the, the life that we all long for, which is more connection, connection to others, connection to nature, which is allows us, those connections are foundational for developing the deeper connections where we are allowed to be in touch again with our entire body, our whole bodily experience, our senses, ourselves. So the reconnection, inner reconnection, needs those outer connections. And so I've always been a proponent of starting at both ends. Many Westerners, when they discovered yoga, when they discovered meditation, breath work, they thought, okay, we'll all get peaceful on the inside, and then we'll have peace in the world. And I was saying, no, 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 let's look at what's happening at the world stage. And what's happening is that governments are handing over power to global corporations, and it's disastrous in terms of that deep, inner self sense of identity and who we are and what it means to be human. And partly what's happened is that that has been linked to sending out the message that we are all greedy by nature. And we greedy people, especially nasty Westerners, are responsible for destroying the climate, impoverishing people in the third world. And so there's been this huge shaming and guilt feelings among Western, uh, particularly middle-class people, being blamed for everything, while in actual fact, those were actually the people who, on the whole, were creating the environmental movement, who were trying to do something, but they weren't paying attention to the global economy. They weren't paying attention to the way that governments were ratifying treaties with corporations. They sounded like they were treaties between countries, but they weren't. It was literally Sweden, United States, Japan, and countries around the world being subjugated by Coca-Cola, Monsanto, HSBC, and essentially global monopolies 
were getting governments to sign treaties that allowed them freedom. So the free trade and the freed finance casino, totally no regulations, was the relationship between governments and this deregulated system. Now, I know that sounds pretty overwhelming, and most people don't really want to think about that. Partly, may, they may not believe it, but I can tell you I have a lot of evidence. And, and the evidence is also specific clauses in the trade treaties now where governments are signing in black and white, we will not do anything that might reduce your profit-making potential. So that means like a Swedish nuclear power company, first of all, in Sweden, we voted unanimously against nuclear power, but the government somehow managed to sneak it in, and then we have a Swedish nuclear power company suing Germany after Germany decides to phase out nuclear after Fukushima. But these things are going on, you know, in terms of chemicals and dams, and, and most people don't know about them. So a lot of my work has been trying to raise awareness about that very far end of the outside world while talking about an inner development that requires community. So community building by strengthening real human scale, interconnected, interwoven community fabrics. And that I've called localization instead of globalization. So I've been sort of a pioneer of what is now a local economy movement. But within that, I'm mainly surrounded by men. There aren't all that many women in any type of economy movement, unfortunately. Just come to Soma, look around. Sorry, what? I said just come here, there's like about four guys in the whole audience. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but this is, see, the women everywhere are leading the way towards the, the community building, the connection to nature. The women are the leaders of the movement that I'm a proponent of, without a doubt, worldwide. Why is that? Because they are more deeply connected to nature. I, they, I just think there is no doubt about that. But, you know, another, another consequence of the mental pollution now is the fear of talking about gender because, and that we have also recently found out is funded by billionaires, by billionaire men who have become transgender. I don't know, I don't know if I dare say this. I mean, I don't know if you know Derek Jensen. Do you know Derek? Anyway, but some of my colleagues have had their lives threatened for saying this. So it's very tricky. Mm. But, it's um, so funny because I was gonna ask you because I didn't know you had an opinion on everything. I'm very glad you do. <laughs> Because I had this out of left field question, I thought, because I'm getting confused myself when the kids are coming back from school saying, oh, my friend at school, and they're like nine and 12, she's saying, oh, she just identifies as non-binary. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, and you're a they? Like, no, I can't I, make sense I, oh, Maybe I really, I'm just really I like, just, naive I would or something. Love, I would love the chance to talk to more of the people who are now starting to identify in this way. With this, you know, my remote big picture, you know, starting with this indigenous culture, where, you know, there was, there was some, um, you know, it's this, I'm talking about a community of about 100,000 people living in about 100 villages in an area the size of Austria. And through that whole region, I, I, I went, I worked there, and there were, there was, some of the population was Muslim, and there were also um, some Christians because missionaries had come and tried to do their best, but they, did, they only got a few orphans. And so there was a small Christian community as well. But anyway, there was, in, to my knowledge, there was only one man who dressed up as a woman and would you know, speak in a high-pitched voice and wore lipstick and so on. And everyone was completely tolerant of that. Everyone knew that. There was no, I mean, they were just so tolerant. And um, so it wasn't a problem. But the idea for them to say what's going on here now would just be seen as madness. And, but it came in slowly into academia in the form of postmodernism. And postmodernism was this supposed attempt to deconstruct everything. And as I've been trying to say for these 45 years, 
The one thing they didn't deconstruct was the globalizing economy where the big banks and corporations were getting more and more power over our every avenue of knowledge, every avenue of knowledge, school books, uh, science, university, media. And as we've seen, social media, we thought was something else. I never did, I have to say. But now I think we're pretty aware that we have to look carefully for sources of knowledge and really search, you know, extremely carefully. But um, I still feel quite hopeful because I think that even though there's been this enormous co-optation going on, everywhere I go, I see people trying to do things differently. And from my analysis, the worst culture that we've ever had, the nadir of Western culture, was in the Victorian age, when this push driving people off the land and also accompanied by the idea that living close to the land is inferior and backward. A whole constellation of things happened also, remember, the history was Christianity. So the body, sensuality, wholeness, right brain, all of this became seen as backward, messy, dirty. They covered piano legs. You couldn't even see a piano leg because that might get someone aroused. So it was really the nadir of this culture, so anti-nature, anti-feminine, anti, I mean, totally racist, and those were the values of the slave owners and the colonizers, explicit values. You can read it. They'll talk, and they talk about schooling as being a type of factory breeding of children to suit their new industries. So that was the cultural nadir. And ever since that time, our culture has actually been moving more towards nature, towards the feminine, towards respect for indigenous people, towards all the values that we all share here. They've had blips because particularly in the last 10 years or so, as many people have been marginalized in this economy, been made to just struggle to survive, you get the Bolsonaros and Trumps who come up and say, we're gonna make our country great again for you and forget about this immigrants and climate, we're going to grow the economy, grow the economy, and make your country great. And they believe that they're going to grow the economy for them, when they're actually continuing to grow the economy for a smaller and smaller group of people. This is what's so crazy, and why I believe we might have a breakthrough, because the truth is now that the direction of the economy is such that we are talking about vastly less than 1% getting richer and richer and richer. And we're seeing it. Less than 1%. And what do they want to do, those guys? They want to go to Mars to fight over more minerals. They want to go to the deepest seabed to fight over minerals, to use more minerals, energy, and technology while replacing people. So the new, the path before us is to understand that bigger picture, to embrace a human and ecological culture, not a techno-economic surveillance culture. And we really need to be quite clear about what are some of the traps. And one of those traps is the politics of identity. The politics that says all white men are bad, and by the way, these politics are only being inserted in the movements. They're affecting the movement. They're not affecting what goes on in the corporate world. You don't have many transgender men dominating HSBC or Monsanto. But what you have is this pol politics of identity pushed on social and environmental movements that are trying to do something to protect the planet, to protect the poor, you know, to do something about what well, we all need. <laughs> we know what we need to do. We need to work for a more just and a more ecological economy. But the f foundations of that, from my perspective, will be very different from what most people who've been critiquing capitalism, they've been doing it, from my point of view, through industrial lenses, not through indigenous lenses. So my indigenous lenses made me embrace going smaller, going slower, 
and that means local. It means particularly local food, but local community and where they come together. I've helped to start all the farmers markets here, and I've done that around the world, help to get a local food movement going. And that's been I'm something I'm very proud of. I don't go advertising it, but it's true for every single, of the four, the four farmers markets we have right in this area. Uh, we, we were behind that directly. And, and it's, yeah, in other parts of the world too, it's a really wonderful demonstration of multiple benefits that can be demonstrated through local food. Should I say something more about local food or let you say something first? Blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't exist. Okay, well, with the local food thing, I just want to explain that when you help to shorten the distance between the farm and the consumer, you are doing something miraculous. You are going against these 500 years where already with slavery, what the traders were doing was separating people from the source of their food, preventing diversified production for their needs as a priority, a type of self-reliance, which was never self-reliance, it was community reliance. You know, there was never any one family going off, you know, growing everything for themselves, but you had community reliance and you had a priority to produce the things you need and then you trade when there's a bit of surplus and you bring in things that you can't produce. What they did with slavery was to totally destroy that, push people onto cotton fields, into tin plantations, coffee plantations, etc. And in England, with the enclosures, they push people away from not only that diversified production, but a range of human scale institutions which they had developed over many hundreds, if not thousands of years. They weren't perfect, it's not that it was perfect, but it's the foundation of where we need to be to have something that could be pretty bloody amazing, pretty bloody near perfect as far as I'm concerned. So the when you shorten the distances, you're going against those 500 years and you're basically stimulating the farmer to diversify. So here I have farmer friends, you know, who told me, you know, like one of them is an organic avocado grower, well, now organic, but he said he'd been a farmer his whole life and they'd just been pressured to produce these standard products at an ever lower price and when we started the farmer's markets, it was like entering another galaxy. And now he's growing about 18 different things. You know, he can sell bits of broccoli, he can sell, he's selling pawpaw, he's got, you know, limes, and, and he, so he's diversifying. And that's, that's what we need to consciously help to create. And we need to help this movement. I hope all of you will help. It needs a lot of help. Still today here, probably only about 10% of the food consumed in this area would come from this region. So there's still a lot that needs to happen, and I'll say more about that later. I better let you say. Right. I would love if you could take us back to Ladakh. Yeah. Because for me, I, I realize like there's a veil that's kind of pulled over our eyes when we're born, and we adopt and absorb our culture, and we basically think that's all that's on offer. And because, you know, I'm a Westerner, I've grown up here, and the places I tended to travel were like Los Angeles or, you know, Hawaii or, you know, places where I'd just basically take my culture and expect to encounter it there. And it wasn't until I went to, you know, India that I got a real culture shock, which was so healthy. And you find your consciousness just expanding and like what's on offer. And then I found the most radical transformation I received in terms of like, culture juxtaposition or culture shock was when I went to Burning Man. I don't know if you've ever been there. No, I haven't been. But, but it, it was absolutely mind-blowing. Um, and I, I recommend everyone go there for many, many different reasons. I went there for the art because it's, it's, it's spectacular. But when we went there, you know, it's the desert and it's so dusty. You've got no idea how much dust you breathe. It gets in everything, all your clothes, all your equipment. I remember when we turned up with this really nice RV and we pulled in and one of the women, because they have to check your car, like to get through security that you're not smuggling other people that haven't paid. So they check your car. And she walked in with these muddy feet. And then she kind of got out. I went, that was 
bit unkind. She could have wiped her feet and I'm wiping the, the floor to get the mud and the dirt off. And my mate goes, Gaz, because he'd been there before, he goes, you've got no idea what's about to happen to this car. And we just learned to live with dust. And so it was such a leveler because everyone's just got to battle this dust, battle these extremes. It's really cold at night. It's really hot in the day. And like it started to expose to me some of the things that happen in our culture, which we're completely unconscious of. One of them was we all make an agreement to dress within these parameters. If I wear this color or this thing, people are going to think you're a weirdo. And that's not within the range of what's okay. So we kind of live between these banks of what's appropriate and acceptable within our culture, because if we step outside of it, we become a target. And you can sort of see that happening at the moment, you know, that, that, uh, that division. So over there, you had to dress like an idiot. You had to dress really wild and crazy. I remember my mate, he's six foot six, and he went there with some friends and he'd never been there before. And he said to his, to my, the guy who was inviting me over, he said, I'll take care of your gear, don't worry. So he fully set him up. So when it was time to get out of the van and join the playa, he um, said, all right, here's, here's your clothes. And it was basically like these pink tights and this little tank top like this. And he said, there you go, mate, there's your gear. He goes, you're joking. He goes, no, I'm serious. He goes, I can't wear that. He goes, that's your outfit. It's either that or you're naked. And so he went, okay. And he just wore that. And, and you notice like you start to melt away into it. doesn't matter how I dress. You have full permission to be someone else. And there they invite you to embody that best part of yourself, whatever that is for you, like turn up as your best supreme self. And there's a gifting economy, so there's no cash allowed there. And everyone trades. And as a member of that community, you bring something over that you're going to give away. And I remember queuing up in the hot sun and there was just a smoothie trail. And just stood up, you just queued up and then you got this amazing smoothie you could choose and they gave it to you and they said, thanks, see you. And I'm like, okay, that's so weird. And literally everyone that you went to would just welcome you with an open heart. And you realize, wow, what is possible in life? because we're all just so conditioned. Mm. So I feel referencing Ladakh for us yeah. gives us what is the world that's possible. Because I see the world that we're entering into now and it really saddens me, like that there's so much of this um, blind acceptance mm. and no one wants to step outside of the range because you become a target. There's that old thing, it just, when you get a critical mass moving in a direction, it's like a freight train. And so I feel like we need, we need different reference points. So if you could really show us, I would love to know, like in that culture, how did they handle conflict, for example? How did they handle trauma? Like what were the things that they were doing different and how were they living just like from waking up to going to bed? Well, that's, Take us to that world. Yeah, well, this again, you know, comes back so much to those many significant others. So talking about clothing, in Ladakh, basically people wore the same clothes except every single item was unique because it was handmade, it was hand dyed, they were still, you know, making their own cloth, dyeing it from natural plants, you know, which was an amazing thing as late as the 70s. But what became so obvious was that when you have those deeper intergenerational connections, you are free to be genuinely yourself, to actually have real individualism through more secure local community fabric. Now this, in the dominant sphere, that's being painted as completely untrue, and we believe that if we were to have strong, tight communities, we'd all be retreating, we'd be fearful of others, we'd be prejudiced. So my experience is absolutely the opposite. It's also the opposite even from Sweden. When I grew up in Sweden, People were all quite secure. They had a secure livelihood. They, were, they weren't threatened in the same way as, as they were when, for corporate needs, the economies keep getting opened up to flood in with cheap labor from the outside. And I saw this even happening in Ladakh and Bhutan, where as the economy starts growing based on foreign investment, outside investment, Suddenly, people are pulled in from the periphery, from poor villages, from Nepal, from Bihar, and they then become a threat to the local population. So it's a complex issue that we need to understand better. But to come back to the everyday 
you know, experience in the traditional culture was that every mother had roughly five to ten live-in caretakers, 24-7, for every child. So that, I would argue, is probably the biggest reason why every child and every parent and everyone was so relaxed and so easygoing. And that relaxed, easygoing way breeds not only you know, a deep self-respect, but also a joy and an ability to have the time to enjoy life. So another thing that came along with that traditional way of life, that time had never, ever been in short supply, never. But you know, the funny thing is, I was out there for half of every year, and it took me several years before I became conscious of some of these things. I was living with the people. I could see how happy they were. I could see so much, but it like, like the whole time issue, I remember distinctly hit me one time when we were outside during the harvest season, which was the most intense work period of all in Ladakh, because at the time of harvest is also when the snow can suddenly fall, it could spoil the crop, so there's a certain time pressure. And yet, there we were sitting in the field, having a picnic in the middle of the harvest day, and then some tourists come past, you know, taking photos and stuff. And then afterwards, the Ladakhi said to me, why are the foreigners always in such a hurry? <laughs> and then it really dawned on me, here we were in the peak working season, and nobody was in a hurry. And that, again, you know, it's, I won't go into mm. all the mechanisms of why we need more local economies, but that's also linked to technologies that serve our needs, not technologies that serve extraction for global players. Ultimately, it's the global players. And I just want to stress, I have met a lot of CEOs, I've met, I've met prime ministers, ministers, the chief economist from the EU, Stieglitz, a Nobel Prize winning economist, another triple Nobel Prize winning economist from the LSE. And my experience is they are no more greedy or terrible than we are. My experience is that when I deal with farmers setting up the farmer's market, they can be every bit as different. Some are more greedy, some less. The same thing up at that top level. What I'm trying to raise awareness about is the problem with the structures of allowing global shareholder-driven corporations to have more and more power over our governments and with that over our knowledge. And so it's the structure, it's like a machine. It's algorithms now that are basically destroying the world. We are importing and exporting exactly the same food product. Right now, UK exports or Australia imports something like 20 billion tons of bottled water from the UK and exports 20 billion tons of bottled water to the UK. But this is going on with milk, with beef, with, and then food is being sent to the other side of the world to be processed. And then we don't hear about that when we talk about climate change. The first thing to do to reduce emissions would be to stop that madness. But we're not hearing it because corporations are setting the agenda. And very often, out of good intention, I'm, but anyway, I, can't, I won't go on about this too much, but it is really important that we understand that. You know, you were saying our culture is such and such. See, from my framing, it's not that we are like that, but we are being herded to be like that. So we keep thinking, we keep owning the story. We say, we do this, we do that. No, we've actually been herded for a long time but more dramatically in the last 30 years when this real corporate sort of takeover using modern media has been able to so channel us according to their needs. So if I just say one more thing about that, and that is that someone named Morris Strong was a self-made Canadian um, multimillionaire in the oil business, and he was married to a Danish woman who was a friend of mine, and she was very green, and she managed to influence him. I even managed to influence him, but not enough. So anyway, he became concerned about the environment, seriously concerned. 
So he went and got his mates from the corporate world. He went and spoke to Gro Harlem Brundtland, who was the prime minister of Norway. And they did a book together called Our Common Future. And they organized this huge environmental gathering in Rio in 92, which many people think was the peak of the environmental movement. For me, it was again the nadir of the environmental movement because that's where the agenda suddenly got much more specialized. No longer were we talking about what Rachel Carson, how many of you know who Rachel Carson is? Oh, that's so sad. If you have any environmental leanings, you really should know who she is. She was this amazing woman scientist who essentially launched the environmental movement. She was American, and she realized that DDT, this pesticide which science thought, we could just put a little bit over here, it'll kill some nasty insects, and that's that. She pointed out, hey, wait a minute, it's affecting birds over here. Can't operate like this. We need holistic, interdisciplinary science. And that's what we were all demanding in the 70s. She was in the late 60s. And then there was an economist, you haven't heard of him either, I'm sure, Schumacher. How many of you heard of Schumacher? Uh, yeah, so Schumacher was a German economist but had a high standing in England. And he wrote a book called Small is Beautiful. And he, as a conventional economist, had been influenced very much the way I was in Ladakh by Burma. Back then, in the late 60s, he'd been to Burma. And he said, wait a minute, these people are supposedly undeveloped, but I'm not seeing any real poverty. I'm very impressed. We need to rethink development and economic growth. And he even brought in the concept of appropriate technology. And anyway, that book, influenced me a lot I, in the sense that I wouldn't have had the courage to write to the Indian government and say, well, here I am, you know, woman linguist, and I think we should have a different economic model. I probably wouldn't have had the arrogance to do that. But I read his book, Small is Beautiful, and said, hey, there is another way. Here's a man, you know, an economist who says we need a different development model. Can I start projects demonstrating renewable energy as an alternative to fossil fuels? And so anyway, but in Rio in 92, these basic questions about science, about the economy, had gone away. And so Morris Strong, through good intention, wasn't going to be questioning corporate power. He wasn't going to be questioning the fact that if they were continuing to go in the direction of over-specialized science linked to bigger and bigger scale business. And that, from my point of view, is what's destroying the world. What we need is the opposite. We need to bring the economy back to a scale where it can be subjugated democratic process. And the best way to start helping that is to start locally, and especially start with food. Food security is fundamental. And you would be amazed at how many things get turned around as we start turning the, the food economy around. Mm -hmm. But if you, want, if you want me to say more about Ladakh, you say so. OK. <laughs> yes, I would love an insight into, for example, like the family structure. You were saying that a family would have 10 people that would that would raise the, help raise the child yeah. and like one of the things i've noticed is a incredible struggle in in our world is you have a nuclear family and then often you have like a single parent of which i'm one and i'm running this place i've got two kids that i love and care for and want to be present to so just overwhelming pressure that that so many people in our culture feel and then it becomes very narky between like a nuclear family of mother and father and they kind of need their freedom so yeah. for me like how do we revive that and what what did their structures look like like i asked like how did they handle like death things like death conflict trauma um and infidelity yeah yeah, well, they handled it all very well. I mean, part, part of what became clear to me was, first of all, that every mother having all those helpers, that included a five-year-old brother or an 80-year-old uncle. So you had this intergenerational family and where boys also grew up caring for young siblings and young animals. And I remember that was another aha moment when I was there 
that I saw this sort of 13-year-old boy cooing over a baby the way grannies do. And I realized I'd never see that in the West. And so we don't know how deep this sort of misogyny has affected our culture. And yeah, so it's, but it's, it's not, you know, for me to see fathers now carrying babies on their chest is like a huge step in the right direction. So we're actually doing, we're trying to do the right thing. But again, I just want to say, I really hope I'll interest some of you in thinking about the economic side of it. Because I would say that with our work, we're offering an agenda, a holistic framing that is so helpful for finding inner um, well-being and simultaneously looking at what we can do for the planet. So we're offering, but it, you know, it, it requires a little bit of rethinking. Um, but so again, you know, how they handled conflict, how they handled death. First of all, when children grew up, looking after animals. By the way, that's another whole conversation about veganism. All indigenous people ate animal products. All traditional cultures engaged with animals. And my experience of them having domesticated animals also has made me feel it's really important to have domesticated animals so that human beings have the opportunity to have that close relationship with animals. And, and of course, they had it with the water and the soil, you know, all of life. Part of that meant you were growing up seeing animals dying. And because you were so connected in the human community, you were part of funerals and so on. It, in, and what I saw is that when you don't fear life, in other words, when you don't fear change, you don't fear death in the way that we do. But we don't realize that part of our fear of death is that we've been so herded into this life where we think we have permanence and, you know, the sort of emblem was almost what I experienced in Sweden in the 70s. I come back to Sweden and found that in half of all the dwellings in Stockholm was one person living alone in a high-rise, fossil fuel-made, cement, modern, ugly building, sitting alone on some floor up there where there might not be anything alive. Depression, alcoholism, you know, the nuclear family already broken down. And I used to talk about that even having a goldfish could help prolong life and help people feel happier. So again, what is it that's taken us away from life and how do we regain contact with life is fundamental to this and not fearing it. But then we have a situation now where the biggest driver of a type of enslavement is this time pressure. So we are so time poor. But the first step for us to deal with that is to move away from the self-blame that a lot of people engage in. They feel, oh, I'm not spending enough time with my children. I'm not looking after my mother. I'm not. We're asking you to just stop, step back a bit and look at the bigger picture and you will not feel self-blame. You'll feel a little bit sorry for yourself having been pushed in this way, but that feels a lot better than self-blame. It's not going to be as disempowering. And it's going to give you an opportunity to realize, okay, here I am. Maybe I'm working for a big corporation. Maybe I'm not spending that much time with my children. But what we're saying is, in order for the change to really be meaningful, it needs to be collective. And so we're urging community steps in the local community to start coming together to think, what can we do to change? And it doesn't mean we're suddenly not going to drive a car or we're going to have to you know, not have our job at the, in the corporation. There is movement that can happen even staying where we are if we would just be willing to take a big breath and, and look at the bigger picture. So, yeah? Yeah. Oh, if we could backtrack a little bit. Yeah. Um, I remember I was sh someone shared a story with me about something that happened in, a, in an African village, traditional yeah. Afri African village, yeah. where there was some serious conflict. Someone had really stepped outside of, of the law of the land and yeah. done something which was 
kind of in some ways punishable by incarceration or something like that. Yeah. And instead of um, shaming that person and shedding them out, like cutting them off from yeah. the tribe, they did something very powerful. They gathered in a circle, put the person in the center, and each person had to say what they loved about that person in the ah. center. <laughs> And then that brought that person back into their heart and they realised, oh, my God, I'd hurt my family. <laughs> so I wonder, is there, like, I'm really curious about what is well, that like the mind of a Ladakhi? Like, do they have yeah. ambition or is it ambition for the, for, the, for the collective as opposed to personal ambition? Because I, you know, I'm personally driven and ambitious yeah. but for community, but yeah. at the same, like, there is this energy in me that's like, I love creating stuff. Yeah. And I wonder yeah. in Ladakh, are they so content that that energy <laughs> isn't really there? Well, I, I, I would say the energy, the same energy to be, you know, creative in that way is not there. I would say that I would, without a doubt, prefer to be reborn as a Ladakhi rather than a Westerner. But for a Westerner to live with them, we might find some of their equanimity a bit also strange. Like for me, I would go away for half the year and come back and I'd be so excited to see my Ladakhi friends. And they would almost act as though they saw me the day before. Mm. And, they, and they did that. <laughs> I saw even with mothers, if their child had been away for half a year or something, it was very, they were so self-contained. And, but I also, watching how they grew up, I realized that that had to do with that deep affirmation of being seen and heard and recognized as a unique individual. I'll maybe give you another example too. So people felt so fine just the way they were. So they didn't have to be creative to do something that other people would admire. So I think a lot of our drive is because we just didn't get enough of that relaxed affirmation. The children were not like the center and, oh, you know, and they were like in the evening, they would sit around the fire and sing and make music. And then a lot of the people would focus on the little ones who would start dancing and singing. Everybody danced and sang. I believe if we all danced and sang, we wouldn't need to do much more, I can tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing how through modernity we've been silenced. Most of us, including me, are afraid to sing. It's like we feel so vulnerable and we've all been felt that we've got to be perfect to sing. We've got to be perfect to dance. We've created, not we, they, this whole system, nobody to blame. This is quite nice about what I'm saying. There's no one to blame. There's no one to be angry at. But this system that has pushed us in this direction, away from nature, away from our innate skills, our innate, unique, every one of us is unique, moment to moment, we change. Every leaf, every light that passes through, every moment in the living world is unique and changing. It's so rich. We don't need to create that much if we go with the flow of that. And, and the singing and the dancing is so much fun. And it's always different to the point where Ladakhi, becoming familiar with modernity, he was embarrassed. He said to me, oh, it's always so spontaneous when they sing and make music. You know, always a bit different. Because when you have traditional instruments also, and you're using like leather and wood, and then the tone is also slightly different every time. So that whole richness of diversity is, yeah, it's it's very, very rich. Another example I want to give you is I did a study on childcare with a professional from England, and we were observing this mother who had um, told her child, she was, the child was going near the stove, and she was saying, no, don't do that, and even, I think, slapped her a bit, which is, but she hugged her at the same time. And so my English professional friend was saying, oh, that's a double bind for the child. And then, of course, I realized not at all because the message was always, we love you, but no, don't do that. And the relaxed way also in that same study, we were asking mothers if they were nervous when their child didn't walk by about one. And it was so funny because they could not understand my question. They just <laughs> could not understand. I had to say it three times. I had to explain more. What? Well, of course they're going to walk at some point. 
You know, what does it matter exactly whether it's, you know, one year or this or that? And so in my book, I write about, you know, every year being in New York, we had an office in Berkeley. I taught at the university there for a while. And by the way, Berkeley in the 70s was like Byron when I first discovered Berkeley. It was pretty fabulous. But anyway, you know, things changed. And when I was going back, you know, there were mothers who were starting to measure the brain size of the baby in the womb worried about it and they were starting to sign up their children to the best schools because they were so worried now all of this comes from this system there is no scarcity of education there is no scarcity of jobs everywhere in the world the natural and the local would be cheaper if we didn't have this system that drove us away from that natural way of doing things everything natural and local would be cheaper Toxic chemical food from far away would probably have to cost five, ten times as much if we had a healthy economy. But not even the Greens are looking at it through the indigenous lenses. They're looking at, you know, a sort of combination of old left anti-capitalism. I'm perfectly happy with the idea that in the long run we could have some interest. People who work harder can earn more. There's got to be subject to democratic scrutiny. Okay, now I'm better hold. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Keep going. Um, yeah. How have you maintained? Because I, I look at you and I tune into you and I think here's a woman who's fighting a big, big <laughs> enemy, right? Or a big, big opponent. Yeah. But you seem so graceful and at peace with it. So I imagine along the journey you must be really frustrated and resentful about the system, and then you just found peace in it. Is that is, would that be correct? Or you've always just been really accepting about this is just the systems that have been created and they need to be dismantled. I've always been so convinced that the majority of people don't want this. And like even as I say, talking to top leaders in business and government, and I just see it as blindness. So I think where I've been a bore is I've been pleading and I've been, you know, but I haven't been angry, mm -hmm. but it's not very attractive to plead. And I've been saying, please, please, please mm -hmm. listen to me. And it's like there's blindness, like you were saying, yeah. but then there's hopelessness. We yes. just think that thing is so big. Yes. Then I just don't know how to no. like, participate yeah. in that. So I'll just, yeah. I'll have to withdraw from it because yeah. it's too overwhelming. Yeah. Do I know enough? Like, you know, there's two sides yeah. to every story. Yeah. Economics before I can make this decision. Yeah. So it feels a bit hard if you're trying to be rational about it. Yeah. No, it's a very good point. And I, yeah, I wish, I hope you'll look at some of our stuff. But I also, I just want to say that I feel the number one step is, if you're interested in what I'm saying, would be to try to connect with a few other people, ideally very human scale, anything from just two to maybe 20 people and try to commit to meeting regularly to look at what can we do. Now, uh, for us, we like to leave people with five words. And the first one is connect. And the next one is rethink. The next one is resist, renew, and celebrate. And uh, the first step of connection, we really urge you to dare to expose your deepest, darkest secrets. We see that one of the biggest, most imprisoning things in our culture is that we have been so scared of being ourselves that we've grown up with developing these masks of being perfect. We've been told because the whole system imposes this idea. Yeah, let me just say that clearly too. I saw it in Ladakh. Every single child longs to be loved and it doesn't go away as you get older. But when those little vulnerable beings who long to be loved are told, oh, if you want to be loved, you've got to look like this and you've, you've got to be a perfect singer and you've got to be different from who you are and you've got to be really educated and then later on you've got to have this gadget and that gadget, otherwise no one will love you. This is where the system is pure evil. It intervenes in a universal human need to be loved. And by these little vulnerable beings, to turn them then into really difficult as a parent to deal with. When they come and say, I've got to have the latest running shoes, I've got to have the latest iPad, the new mobile phone, and you as a parent say, sorry, you're not going to have it. For the child, it feels 
like they're not going to get that love and appreciation of the peer group. Now, the peer group comes also very much from the schooling that segregates into separate ages. So, I mean, again, there we have advice about everything. You know, that is to try to come together with some other parents who have similar values so that you're encouraging them towards something else, away from this insidious consumer culture. But the most evil thing about it is that it has told the child you have to wear a mask and be perfect if you want to be loved. So one of the first things we can do as adults for ourselves is to try to take that mask away and come together in human scale circles to really deepen our connection. It's the best therapy and it's better than professional paid therapy because we really want to feel that we belong. And that feeling of belonging you can do it in this, this sort of formula. It's not easy because we're so afraid of it. We've been so, but the more aware we become of how different it feels, if we then say, connected, what can we do? And we're looking at as a program of say, between three and 20 people, what are we gonna do? Then, don't forget what we're saying about the big picture is we're not trying to change a big section of the population. Honestly, it is much less than 1% that's driving this insanity. Whatever you think about COVID now, what's happening is insane because we all know what this medical system delivers as food in the hospital. We know that no government is putting out the message that take vitamin D, take vitamin C, stay out of the hospital. No, they're putting out the message, you're gonna die, and you know, and virtually encouraging people to come to the hospital when we know there are too few ICU beds. I mean, it's just, so, and this is like this algorithmic escalation of this commercial system influencing what's happening. So to come together and realize that actually the drivers are much less than 1%. 1% of the global population now would be something like 70 million people. In studying how this has been going on over the last 30 years, I would estimate that we might be talking about 10,000 maybe 10,000 people actually driving this. Most ministers in most governments don't even know about it. So it's just, so they don't even know why the governments are getting poorer, why the local council here is policing us. If we want to build a staircase in our house, we get policed by the government, while when the global corporations want to do as they want, they're telling governments, getting them signed in black and white. We're gonna do exactly as we like. And they can dump X number of billion tons of CO2 emissions, pretend that carbon sequestration, the way they're doing it is working for climate, is making it worse. So it's really, but we're talking about 10,000, like that's not even 1% of 1%. So it's not so big. It's just about looking at the picture long enough to say, wow, it's just that small group of people. Aren't we mugs? The human race, aren't we mugs to fall for this? Why do so, you think we fall for it? Because we don't know about it. And we don't know about it because they have made sure that we don't know about it. So in Sweden, they even passed a law that these trade negotiations had, be, had to be done in secrecy. They see that they're doing it from the naive idea that Volvo, oh yeah, they must have trade secrets, so therefore trade deals must be done in secrecy. So even the people who'd go along with that are not aware of what this is about. So there, I mean, I'm, I helped to set up a forum of about 40 of us who studied this around the world. We are like the experts in the world of what this is. But I tell you, you know, people, I don't know if you've heard of Ralph Nader, um, you're so disappointed in this audience, I know. No, 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 no. I'm not disappointed at all. I'm just, I'm just aware. I'm just aware that we don't know about it. Yeah. And I'm telling you, like, ministers don't know about it. Mm. And leading environmentalists don't know about it. So it's, yeah, that's, that's a tricky part of it. But I feel like, you know, with COVID now, there may, there may be, you know, things have just gone a bit too far, a bit too crazy, and there may be quite a wake up. Helena, why do you think so many people are compliant rather than question 
what the authority tells them to do? Well, I trace it back to school. There's yeah. a few different things. Like when a soul is born, you have two gods, mother and father, the first yeah. guru, the first teacher. Yeah. So there's a natural obedience that nature needs in order for you to survive well in the world. And then that is developed further when we put kids into school away from the care of parents. And then we dress them in a uniform way and we put them in rows. And there's a teacher who's an authority who cannot be questioned. And you have a principal who is the boss. You go to a job and you have a boss. So you have someone who's above me. We're being so conditioned that we get our authority from someone else. And it's so insidious. So whatever the media says, whatever some, you know, premier says, we just go, okay, got to do it. And a friend showed me a picture the other day. It was beautiful. It had, you know, some fat, hideous men sitting around, you know, smoking and like thinking they were ruling the world. And there was this board game. And underneath that board game were all these human beings like this. And the board game were just sitting on their backs. And it said, the game's over the moment we stand up. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, and and I that's, think, yeah. that's what I feel happens. Like there's so much blindness, just blind acceptance of that. Like a television is God. Like we've just been so conditioned. It changes your brainwaves. So it, that just goes into your psyche. And we've just become, and even when you're reading something, unless you've developed a certain degree of intellectual like strength, rigor, and discernment, you just, you, you believe what you see. So now when I see an address or I read something, there's part of me which just, questions it automatically but most people haven't developed that so we just whatever there's an authority which is telling me who i am and how i should think and that's why i think this is a war on consciousness question everything if it doesn't agree with your own intelligence yeah and and also what he said which also is key to what i'm saying which is test it against your experience and that means trusting experiential knowledge and in modern schooling, what they've done is to drive experiential knowledge out of us. And, you know, literally to the point now, you can't say the sun is shining without citing someone, you know, having a reference. It's like insane. So experiential knowledge now has been absolutely, you know, ditched. There are important thinkers, though, like Ian McGilchrist, who's been studying left-right brain, who really is bringing things back. So there are so many good people and so many good things and so many good voices in the right direction. What I was talking about in terms of understanding how small the number is on the other side, driving these algorithms in the wrong direction. Like I say, I think, I really think it wouldn't be more than, it might be 20,000 I don't know, even possibly a million. That's still like less than 1% of the global, vastly less. 80 million will be 1%. Mm, isn't, so it like point, like, isn't it like 16 families? Isn't it like 16 families? Well, no, like a massive... you see, that's an that's a unfortunate myth. It's mm -hmm. not to do with particular families. There have been families, obviously. The Rockefellers played a big role. But no, this is translated more into these structures of this corporate relationship. Transnational with, corporations, yeah. 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 Mm. How has spending time in Ladakh, Tibet, influenced your own spirituality and practices? Well, you know, what happened was that I, in Ladakh, I just, I fell in love with the people. I met the Dalai Lama many times. I got to have many private meetings with him. And I found that almost everybody in Ladakh was like the Dalai Lama. I just found this lightness mm -hmm. of being and this joy. So I became more a student of the way, the whole way of life than a particular Buddhist practice. And I didn't really start meditating until much later. And even now, I don't do long meditation. And there, my biggest teacher has been my husband has chronic fatigue, which has been really difficult so trying for me and it would lead to me being so angry at this illness you know he's had it now for 28 years mm -hmm. we've been together 44 years and mm -hmm. we work together in Ladakh so we're so close like really uh, in a relatively healthy way codependent but it's but I I found that um, techniques like tapping like EFT mm -hmm. I found really helpful and I, when I first read about it, someone um, was saying that one of the best ways is to look yourself in the mirror and speak out loud as you change the tape. And so I've developed now that ability to just, you know, say, 
even though I'm so fed up and angry and think I can't take it, I can flood myself with light, I can love myself enough to be happy, and I can just turn it around like that. I mean, not always, but amazingly effective. So if you don't know about EFT, but also that trick of looking yourself in the mirror and speaking it out loud, I found that even more effective. Um, and then I do, my, my meditation is to, yeah, just every day I do the lighthouse walk and I just always do it in a meditative way, most of the time. I mean, I'm sometimes walking with my husband and we get into arguments about COVID or something, but, <laughs> but I, you know, I really just, uh, for me, nature is my religion. Could you give an example of what a local future would look like yeah. for Byron Bay over the next 10 years? And the second part of that is, are you concerned about a lack of diversity um, with a essentially homogenous just group of people? Do you need to, how do you create the tension between allowing people to travel and ideas to move and having um, a focus on local? Yeah, well, you see, again, the key is that if we have more secure communities, and wherever the places are, we'll be, we'll be moving towards smaller cities. I mean, the localization agenda is the opposite of the dominant one. The dominant one is pushing us into AI-driven cities where robots will be doing more and more. There'll be more and more unemployment. They're, they're trying to destroy hundreds of millions of farmers, hundreds of millions who are protesting also the UN, the WHO, is for medicine, what the FAO is in agriculture. So there they're pushing robots linked to drones, linked to satellites to monitor carbon in the name of climate. But for these hundreds of millions of farmers, what and for the whole world, what the localization agenda is about is allowing people to stay in villages and smaller cities and building up certain level of renewable energy infrastructure, but very different from the big green new deal. You know, these are technologies adapted to what human society actually needs to flourish. So here in Byron, the way my big dream would be that we would have a really enlightened population that would help us strengthen the local food movement. One of the things I'm gonna be doing an article in the Echo, I've been meaning to do it forever, to argue that they must let people subdivide if they want. Even if you wanted to peel off two acres, five acres here to, for an eco-community of affordable housing, connected to food growing, you should be able to do that. In fact, you should be pressured to do it. And you should be pressured to do it in a way that will be genuinely affordable. It will not involve outside investment. That's the global model. Outside investment comes into your community which means they're gonna be extracting more than they put in. So in the localization movement, the economists I work with are looking at genuinely circular economies. Corporate world is talking about circular economy, exactly opposite. We're talking about societal circular economies, where a community, a town, a region, decides to make their economy circular. And that means the investment comes from inside to support. A business needs to site here to sell here. It can expand into the region. There can be international trade as well. But what you're trying to get is a really healthy, thriving, circular economy where people can see so that they have a completely different progress indicator. In the global system, GDP goes up. If we all fall ill, and have to have cancer, chemotherapy, you know, as long as possible, whatever, GDP goes up. If we go home and plant a garden and stay healthy, GDP goes down. And this is the measure our governments use to, to measure progress. And you see, you don't have to know a lot to know those few facts that nobody can deny. So you don't have to be an economist. Whatever you do, don't study economics. What you want to study is what this economic system is doing. And it doesn't take long to see how these key elements. So there are places now where some local councils, like in Froome in England, they started a process of having all, the goal was to have all the councillors go independent, leave party politics, and represent Byron 
In the case of England, it was this town named Froome. That's very similar to Barra, quite alternative. And the first election, about half of them were independents for Barra. The next election, 100%. And that's what we want here, too. 100% representation for our needs to do what we need to do and to stand up against some of the opposition from the state and national government. But if they oppose people selling off some of their land at a reasonable price for affordable housing and food security, so it should also be linked to doing food production for, the local, for local needs, we can show this is the best thing in climate, for climate, for jobs, for taking us away from needing any, you know, uh, unemployment fees. And we could actually be more self-reliant if they would let us. And so much to do with regulations. So the regulations that have been brought in around food and farming especially, but also public health and safety, most of them are bogus. And they've mostly been brought in from lobbying by big business. So we were at, you know, looking at this in like 1990, and then the hotel chains were lobbying the US government that families couldn't have bed and breakfast in their house if they didn't have a $5,000 fireproof door, fireproof mattresses, which are toxic anyway. And that was all to destroy the competitor of people having that. You know? So anyway, there's lots of examples like that, that mm -hmm. It wouldn't take that long to, to really understand what we need to do to, to create a very different economy. Would you say like the, the way we could all start next week, the simplest thing we could do was to choose to buy from farmer's market? Like that would be a massive, a good, positive step, wouldn't it? That would be a good step, but I would almost rather that you would commit to helping to spread awareness about the need that you would um, volunteer to help build a stronger movement for local food. So this is the problem. Very often we've been trained to think, okay, what can I do with my shopping habits? And yes, it would be good if you shopped at the farmer's market. But right now we have a problem with how they're run. They could be run better, and we'd like more community involvement in running them. And we want more farmer's markets. I started... To, to think of doing one in Suffolk Park, because there are quite a few small growers who can't get into the current market. So we need more markets. Ultimately, we need to have a covered market where we can have local regional food every day of the week. So we used to have in most European cities until not that long ago. I would say whether you're in the city or here, you know, one of them is what I said, is that practicing the deeper connection in, in a group. It, not through a therapist where you, un, you know, cover everything about all your flaws and everything, but actually start a process where you have the courage to show your flaws and your fears and anxieties and to show that you're not perfect. That helps, you know, it has to be done with a certain amount of wisdom and people that you're beginning to get to know and that you trust so that you, you grow together in that deeper connection. It's, one of, it's the most important healing thing for adults and children that could happen. The nature connection, conscious nature connection as a spiritual practice for children also to be helped to just spend some time feeling themselves part of the tree or the sky, not just kicking a football around you know, in a competitive way, which is also fine, but it's developing a type of spiritual practice that is through the deeper community connection and the connection to nature. So about meditation and breath work and all that, you all know about anyway. So I'd end up not talking very much about that because there's so much awareness about that, which is also very important. But then the, the other thing is to be conscious about trying to make those connections for yourself and your children in an intergenerational way and try to encourage as much intergenerational socializing, try to bring that back to the Steiner schools also or try to find alternative schooling where they're not segregated into separate age groups. It's a really disastrous effect. You know, it has a profound negative effect. I would also cultivate more 
of a participatory culture so that we're singing and dancing together, not a spectator and an observer, you know, sort of, so that we start coming together. And it's, it's being done in now in sort of a lot of the new local cultures that are coming back. And sometimes they bring back things like barn dances and Kayleys and things that, you know, people, you know, who are five and people who are 80 can join in. It can seem a bit hokey, but it's actually really healthy. So I have an organization called localfutures.org. So on our website, you can find a lot of materials. Localfutures.org. Localfutures.org. And it's, it, we have, we, if you wanted to do a PhD on localization and anti-globalization, you would find lots of materials there, you know, just a lot, including voices from other people uh, who've had respect for indigenous culture or who are indigenous leaders. Also, Russell Brand has been quite supportive and... Um, yeah, even I studied with Noam Chomsky, so he also supported. We started something called World Localization Day two years ago, where we're trying to make visible the emerging localization movement around the world, which is led by women everywhere. And, and yet, it's hard to get women representatives to speak. So in our program, still, probably the majority were men. And this is something that I, I'm hoping to do courses on, you know, sort of training women in this, because they are the real leaders. It was in Japan, you know, it was they who realized we need fresh, healthy food and defended their seeds, you know, now in COVID, they set up a whole network across the country. Mothers focus on this as their most important medicine. And just, yeah, it's just, and all, there's so many things that you might not think of as localization. Localization is about, as we define it, from the indigenous perspective, coming back to the more natural way of doing things, which also restores faith in our own innate knowledge, our inner knowledge, our deeper knowledge from our souls and our bodies. We have that deep wisdom. And part of the work that Gary's doing with this, this raising of consciousness is to come back to that. And it comes back as we also connect with the rest of life. And that's why, you know. But also the, um, well, yeah, I better not go on too much, but we have World Localization Day. We have a, a long program from that. We've got the film, The Economics of Happiness, which Gary showed in Sydney at Conscious Club, and which went around the world and was quite a hit. And we had a Facebook page that shot up to 140,000, and then we were shadow banned. So what people don't realize is that this type of localization is the biggest threat to big business. And this type of localization I'm talking about, there is so much more happening than you can imagine. It's really empowering. That's partly why I also feel, you know, every day I get good news in my inbox, and then I've been saying to people, I started the farmer's markets in Byron. And then the other day I found out there's another farmer's market I didn't even know about in Federal. I didn't start that one. So it does show, I'm trying to say, even I, an expert in localization, don't even know what's happening right here. So this is, there's so much more positive out there. And of course, we don't get any of that served to us in the media. and We don't get any of it served in a holistic, systemic way, so we understand how significant it is. Maybe another, let me give you another example. There is a book that finally penetrated through so that a lot of people know about it. It's called Humankind. Most people are not aware that we've been subjected to propaganda, that human beings are greedy and nasty by nature, and they don't realize how amazing it is that this book got out called Humankind. It says the opposite. And it gives all of these examples. Really recommend it. All right. We're going to <laughs> say thank you yeah. for your time. You. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, so, thank you. Yeah. You're an absolute gem. We're so privileged oh, okay. to have you in the community and doing all the work you're doing. If any of you are interested, please be in touch.